new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. Or I saw up as we pray together. A great God in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the truth. Thank you for the spiritual knowledge and revelation you are giving to us. Lord, we pray that this revelation will transform everyone at the Bible study here and every place today in Jesus' name. We're asking, oh Lord, the entrance of your word will bring light, will bring strength, will bring courage, will bring boldness and conviction to live a life that is uncompromising in righteousness in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you keep us awake. As we study your word together, you energize, empower every one of us to walk in the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. And the blessing and the benefit, the profit of following you through and through, your grant to every one of us. Be blessed and glorified, exalted in the Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come once again to our Bible study. And I welcome those who are coming for the first time. And I pray that this will be an exciting, a joyful and uplifting experience in your life in Jesus' name. We'll be studying the book of Daniel. We're sitting in chapter 1. We're coming to Daniel chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 17, which is the passage of study today. Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. As for these four children, that means Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel, uh, uh, with all these, his uh, three friends and companions. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, examined them. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, none like Ananiah, none like Mishael, and none like Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. 
and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them. He found them how many times better? Ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all Israel. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. That's what we're studying about. You'll find that the champion of the passage, the leading figure of the passage, you'll find that the one in the forefront of the rest of them in the passage is the man, Daniel. Young man, Daniel. As you look at the book of Daniel, we have quite a lot of personalities, a lot of individuals. You have Daniel, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You have Nebuchadnezzar himself. You have Cyrus. You have Belshazzar. You have quite a lot of people. Some of them, they come in directly and, they are, and we're told their names. Some of them, they come in in pictures, in parables, or in prophecies. And yet, beyond them all, above them all, towering high, above everyone, is this Daniel. From his teenage years, we find him in chapter 1. And then he goes on growing older and older. By the time you come to the end of the book, it's about 90 years of age. And we find nothing negative written about him. And a very central thing in his life is what you'll find in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Because his heart was right, his life was right. Because his heart was strong, his life behavior was strong. Because his heart had conviction, his life also had conviction. Because his heart was stable, because of that, his life was stable. Because his heart was faithful unto the Lord, his life was faithful unto the Lord. If you're going to be anybody in life, if you're going to do anything in life, if you're going to be exalted, and if you're going to be blessed in life, it is the heart, the condition of your heart, a converted heart, a cleansed heart, a sanctified heart, a circumcised heart, will give you a life that will be noticeable and blessed in heaven. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself or the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. One word that has been coming over and over. As we have looked at the life of Daniel, is that word uncompromising. Uncompromising. That means he made up his mind. And he said, compromise will be strange to me, will be a foreigner to me. If there is anything I will never do, it is this. I will never compromise my conviction, my knowledge, my stand, my vow, my consecration to the Lord. You see, it is compromise that ruins the lives of people. And we have a number of people in the Bible that compromise and they ruin themselves. Aaron, number one. Balaam, number two. Gideon, number three. Samson, number four. Eli number five, Saul number six, Solomon number seven, Ahithophel number eight, the young prophet number nine, and many others. Aaron compromised his convictions and led Israel into idolatry and he lost the privilege of entering into the promised land. Balaam compromised and lost his life under the wrath of God. Gideon compromised and brought a snare upon himself, upon his family, and upon the whole nation. You remember Samson? He compromised his righteous devotion to God, and he lost his strength, he lost his sight, and he lost his ministry, and lost his life. Eli compromised the divine standard for the priesthood, and he lost the priesthood. He lost the ark of God and the glory of God departed from Israel. Saul compromised his divine calling and commission and he lost his royal privilege and he lost the indwelling spirit eventually lost his life. Solomon, a man of great wisdom but wisdom without steadiness in the heart. Wisdom without a purpose seen in the heart and wisdom without a foundation 
of real conversion, commitment, and consecration to the Lord will not go very far because of that. Solomon compromised the commandment of God for Israel's kings and married pagan, uh, pagan women. And uh, we're told he married unbelieving women and he lost the favor of God. He lost the United Kingdom of Israel, Ahithophel. A wise man. We're told that the council of Ahithophel, when was following after David, it was like an angel was, was counseling somebody. But, you know, whatever wisdom in counseling you have, whatever practical knowledge of living you have, and whatever strategies or methods you have, to be able to direct even a king like David without a purpose of heart, you'll crumble. And you will stumble and you will compromise. Therefore, he so feel compromise is loyalty to the anointed of the Lord. And he lost earthly life and eternal life in the rebellion of Absalom. The young prophet, you remember him. That's the one that was faithful to a particular point. And then he sat down, he rested, and the old prophet came and said, Are you not that man that came from Bethlehem? Jesus said, Yes, I am. Come home with me and eat and, and drink. And he said, No, I may not, because the Lord had told me, You must not eat in that place, you must not drink in that place. Oh, that other fellow told him a lie, an angel spoke to me. He went back. That was his compromise. And what happened? He lost his life. We're told that that young prophet compromised his faithfulness to the, to the word of God. And he lost his ministry. He lost his life. He lost his posterity to the lions. But thank God, the Bible is not just talking about people that compromised. The Bible is talking also about people that lived on compromising lives. The people that say, I have only one life to live. I will go through this life only once. And that one time will be a life of no compromise. No compromise with the devil. No compromise with sin. No compromise with society. No compromise in everything the Lord has taught me. I'm going to stand firm. Firm unto the end. We have a number of them. Joseph lived an uncompromising life and received the fulfillment of his God giving dreams. You remember Moses? Moses lived an uncompromising life and was granted special favors by the Almighty God. You remember Caleb? Caleb lived an uncompromising life and was kept alive until he received his portion in the promised land. Joshua lived an uncompromising life and was given the leadership position over Israel. Now a lady, a woman, rose. She lived an uncompromising life and she had the reproach of widowhood taken away. And Samuel lived an uncompromising life and was in favor with God. God throughout his life. You remember Elijah. He lived at a time when the children of Israel had gone away following after, ba after Baal and after Ahab and Jezebel. But you know, that man, Elijah, he lived an uncompromising life and received spectacular answers to all his prayers. Nehemiah lived an uncompromising life and did great exploits in troublous times. Mordecai. You see, Mordecai, when Haman was passing by, everybody bowed down. It's like they must worship the man because of his position, his power, and his cruelty and wickedness. But Mordecai will not submit to anything like that. And he said, why are you not submitting to this man? Haman said, I am a Jew. I am a Jew. A believing Jew. And because of that, I have a stand to take. And that man refused to compromise and was promoted to great honors until the Bible says this man, Mordecai, works greater and greater. You remember Job, he lived an uncompromising un life and God made an edge about him and about all that he has on every side. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Don't forget Enoch. That man that lived at such a corrupt time, a terrible time, a time when everybody went their way, but were told that Enoch walked with God without any compromise. And that man would not die, and the Lord lifted him up, and he was raptured even at that time. 
The uncompromising life attracts God's recognition on earth and great rewards in eternity. That's what the Lord is calling us today to that we will live a righteous life, a sanctified life, a holy life, a pure life, and whatever the temptation and whatever the circumstance, we will not compromise, and a great reward of God will be upon your life. I say God will reward you abundantly. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, spiritual perception given to an uncompromising life. Spiritual perception giving to you an uncompromising life. Number two, special progress gained through an uncompromising life. Special progress gained through an uncompromising life. And then number three, supernatural preservation granted for an uncompromising life. Supernatural preservation granted for an uncompromising life. We're back to Daniel chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 17. Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. I want you to notice that for, for those uh, for, uh, uh, words, uh, the first line, as for these four children, who are those four children? Go back to verse 11. Then Daniel said to Melza, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the four. Daniel number one, Ananiah number two, Mishael number three, Azariah number four. As for these four children, what we learned about them, those three were friends of Daniel. They were the companions of Daniel. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we're looking at verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known unto Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What are they called? The last two words, his companions. Uh, that means then that Daniel had a saving influence. Daniel had a righteous influence. Daniel had a sanctifying influence upon those other three. Upon Ananiah, upon Mishael, upon Azariah. They were his friends. And because they were his friends and companions, he had influence on them. If we're going to learn anything at all, that if you're righteous, if you're a child of God, you must have some friends. And you must have some righteous influence sanctifying influence, a steady influence, a, a great influence upon those companions, upon those people that are close to you. We're told in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 63. I'm a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. Daniel said, you are my friends, now we're going to take this time together. Daniel said, you are my companions, and we're going to walk in the narrow way together. We're going to live in the light of the knowledge of the word of God together. I am a companion of those of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. You have friends, you have neighbors, you have companions, you must have a saving influence on them, a righteous influence on them, a sanctifying influence on them. And if, if you are just born again, and you know, those friends that you had before you were born again, you must have that same soul saving, soul winning influence on them. We're looking at Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, verse 19. How be Jesus suffered him not, but says unto him, Go home to thy friends. You see the commandment of the Lord to that man and the commandment of the Lord to you. You are born again. You are a child of God. You have been saved. You are set free. You are delivered. You are healed. Go back home to your friends. And then it says, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee. 
If he has saved you, he has done something for you. If he has sanctified you, he has done something for you. If he makes you to have a steady life of righteousness and has given you abundant grace to resist temptation and to stand firm in the things of the Lord, you must tell your friends, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has, has, had on you, has done for thee and has had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. And there's another man in the Bible, his name is Cornelius. He came and the Lord appeared to him by an angel. And when the Lord appeared to him, he said, send for Peter and Peter will tell you the words of life, the words of salvation, the word that will prepare you for heaven. What did he do? Uh, when he sent people to go and call Peter, he called his friends together. You see, that is what we find uniform in the Bible, that when God has appeared to you, and God has given you grace, and God has given you favor, you will touch your friends with his soul-saving hand. You'll touch your friend with his sanctifying influence. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 24. Acts, chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 24. And on, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for him and had called together his king's men and near friends. He called together his king's men and his near friends. He was expecting the messenger of God is coming. The preacher of the gospel is coming. The one that will show me the truth and reveal the truth to me so that my life will be transformed is coming. I'm not going to listen to that alone. I'm not going to go to heaven alone. All my friends are going to hear this with me. Verse 33. Immediately therefore I sent to thee and thou hast done well that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here? Are we all here? Me and my friends, me and my household, everyone with my companions, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? Verse 44, while Peter yet speak these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. You see that? Uh, that that's, the, that's the influence that he had upon those friends. Was the Lord telling us, take time to be holy? Speak up to the Lord. Isn't that the life of Daniel? He took time to be holy. And he spoke often. He prayed often to the Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Listen to this. Make friends of God's children. And have great influence on them. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him, thou shalt be, listen to this, thy friends in thy conduct, thy friends in thy conduct, thy friends, thy companions in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. And that's the beauty of the righteous life, that you're able to have influence upon your friends, and those friends, they're able to turn to the Lord, and the same righteous stand you take, that same righteous stand you'll take in Jesus' name. You'll influence your friends. I said you will influence your friends. You'll win your friends to Christ and win them to a life of righteousness. And you make them to have the same purpose of heart that you have, that you will not compromise. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We're looking at verse 17 again as for these four children. Now you know the influence on the other three. Daniel plus three. One plus three making four. It says God give them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel were told and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel had Knowledge, skill, ability, provision in all wisdom, visions, dreams. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 2. In Proverbs chapter 2, we're reading from verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom 
and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for he treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. That's what Daniel did. He was passionate in his seeking for knowledge. He was very desirous in seeking for knowledge. And because he loved to have knowledge so much, the Lord blessed him with that knowledge. We're told him verse in verse 6, for the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for his for the righteous, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Because Daniel committed himself to walking uprightly, and he sought the Lord, and he said, Lord, if I need anything in this world, is the knowledge of the, of the holy things, is the knowledge of the sanctified life, is the knowledge that will make me to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. And that's exactly what the Lord gave him, and the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 26, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. It says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight. You see, Daniel, he was good in the sight of the Lord. He lived a righteous life, a saved life, a life that had been set free from sin. And because he lived that life by the grace, divine grace that came from above, the Lord gave him wisdom. Because the Bible says, For God giveth him to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. That same thing that God did for such people, the Lord will do for you. If the Lord is going to do it, we need to ask. We must ask him. We must pray. In fact, we are told in James chapter 1, reading from verses 5 through to 8, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, don't you think that Daniel needed wisdom to live in Babylon? It was a strange land. It was a defiled land. It was a defiling land. It was a corrupt land, a corrupting land. A land that could take his conviction away from him. Therefore, he needed the wisdom of God, the power of the Lord, and the boldness to live to the glory of God. He needed the wisdom to be able to walk day after day in the strength of the Lord and in the knowledge of the Holy, in the knowledge of the Holy One. Therefore, he asked the Lord and the Lord gave it to him. And the Lord is saying, you too can ask, you too can pray, and you can request from the Lord and say, Lord, here is my need and God will meet that need in Jesus' name. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all all men, no exception, give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. It will be given to you. Do you know you can have more wisdom today than you had in all your previous life? The wisdom to live and the wisdom to please the Lord and the wisdom to attract the blessings of God into your life. This day it will happen. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven or the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. As we have seen in the life of Daniel and his three companions, his three friends, and many others in the Bible, there are godly men and godly women who will not compromise their conviction in any situation. Such faithful believers will not abandon their biblical conviction and moral standard for any personal gain. You know that Daniel had been brought to this uh, particular school. We call it college now. And then he was given scholarship. And all that he needed, accommodation plus feeding. Everything totally given and supplied by the king. And yet he said, yes, I appreciate the scholarship. I appreciate the opportunity to learn. But there's something the scholarship will not take away from me. It will not take my conviction in following the Lord. That scholarship will never take it away from me. Yes, I appreciate every good thing that I can have in this life. And what you give me, that's what Daniel was saying. 
but whatever you give me, you cannot compare it with my relationship with God. And if there's anything I'm going to hold on to is the foundation of righteousness and relationship with the Lord, which I already have before all those opportunities came, and nothing will take it away from me. If you are of that mind, you'll be an uncompromising brother, an uncompromising sister, and the blessings of the Lord will be eternal in your life in Jesus' name. Such faithful believers will not abandon their conviction and their moral standard for any personal gain as a recompense. That means as a compensation for their integrity, for their faithfulness, for their uncompromising life. God gave Daniel, Shagram, Meshach, and Abednego natural skill and spiritual gifts. They were diligent in their commitment to duty and they took all necessary steps for studying hard. And then we're told that they had both uncompromising life and an uncommon love for learning, trusting, and depending on God in all their spiritual devotions and secular duties. The Lord granted them great attainments in learning and extraordinary achievements. In fact, we are told God gave them knowledge. And God is still in the business of giving his faithful people knowledge today, and we have it today. He gave them knowledge. And he's still giving, he gave, he's giving, he'll keep on giving and skill in all learning and wisdom. Whatever pleasures of defilement they deprived themselves of, then we know because of this that they had, they were adequately recognized and rewarded by God. They kept their convictions to the minutest details, and God rewarded them with the greatest of endowments. The sunshine of their spiritual perception brought much light to the king Nebuchadnezzar and to the nation of Babylon in later years. An enlightened mind, that's what they had. It's a renewed spirit, that's what God gave them. A clear brain, a sound, perceiving, understanding heart, a happy life, a healthy body, an influential personality, or the lifelong possession. Think about that. That's more than, you know, what they bargained for. They didn't know that God will give them so much when they were committing their lives to that uncompromising standard of, of, belief, of the believers living. Their spiritual endowments included special gifts of inspiration. Uncommon, unknown, in their days, Daniel was endowed with prophetic gifts and insight into the mind of the Spirit. He was enabled to commune with God and to receive revelations from heaven like no other man in his generation. Hidden mysteries were discovered and understood and interpreted by Daniel, and he became God's special ambassador to a foreign nation in the hour of their greatest need. There is a great spiritual need in every nation today. Only godly men and women of uncommon conviction and uncompromising life will be used of God to meet that need. But what are we going to do? How can we have such a thing? Well, we're told in the New Testament we have a privilege to and we have the promise to you. And we have the gifts of the Spirit like Daniel had. We can have it today. It will be our portion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 7 all through to verse 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with that. The manifestation of the Spirit given to every man. You've read about Daniel, how God gave him wisdom knowledge, skill, ability to interpret dreams, even to recollect the, forgiving, the, for, the forgotten dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And if God did that at his own time to make him useful in a foreign land, he can do that today because it says in that verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. That's the gift of the Spirit. You're saved. You're sanctified. You can be baptized by, in the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Immersed in the Holy Ghost for you to have the power, the anointing, the unction, the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And then these gifts can become, uh, can fill up your life. And to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. 
to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit and to another faith by the same spirit and to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit the lord can give you gifts of healing too that when members of the family are sick, you lay your hands on them, they will recover in Jesus' name. And when there are needs around you, then you pray, and the Lord gives you the key, the key to the kingdom, and that key will open every locked door, and miracles will be abundant through your life in Jesus' name. And to another, in verse 9, faith by the same Spirit, and to another, the gifts of healing uh, by the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the sunny of spirits and to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another interpretation of tongues but all these workers that one and self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will as the Lord gave to those uncompromising children of God today those who live sanctified lives righteous lives holy lives, they open themselves up to the gifts of God and the gifts of the Spirit abundantly will be given to them even today in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at Daniel chapter one. In Daniel chapter one, we're looking at verse 18. Now, at the end of the days, that the king had said that he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now notice this, that it was the king that provided the scholarship. And now they had finished the three-year course. And they were to be examined at the end, evaluated at the end. And also something you'll discover here is that Nebuchadnezzar was very close to those people that were learning. He was very close to all those students because he had provided the scholarship. Not only that, they were preparing them to serve in the palace. And therefore, he became very conversant with them. He knew them very well. In fact, at the end of the course, they brought all these people, not only Daniel, not only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not only the four, everyone, they brought them to Nebuchadnezzar. We learn a lesson there as leaders. Leaders of a nation. Leaders of a company, leaders of a community, and leaders of a church, we must be close to the people, interact with the people. And even those who are learning, they are training to become workers, or they are training to become more useful in the kingdom of God, we must become very close to them. We will not just stay aloof and stay far away, that we have no touch and no connection with the people who are being trained to serve in the kingdom. In verse 19, and the king communed with them, and the king discussed with them, and the king evaluated them. Them. And the king, we're told, he examined them. And among them all was found none, like Daniel, and Ananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. If they were going to serve in the king's palace, if they were going to be useful and profitable to his kingdom, he must know them. He must examine them. He must evaluate them. He must be able to know whether they are suitable or not. That's why he took personal interest and personal involvement in examining them. In verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better, will be better than all these people of the world. Ten times higher, ten times greater, ten times better, ten times wiser than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all his realm. After three years of concentrated study and learning, Daniel and his three companions with all the others were brought before the king to be examined by them. The king himself was a man of great learning. Notice that the king himself was a man of great learning. And they were told he was a man of great experience. Though he had, they had studied the science of the Chaldeans. Chiefly, they studied natural history. Natural history. If you're going to rule a nation, 
You must know the history of that nation. And Nebuchadnezzar knew the history of that nation. He examined them in that history. And then we're told that uh, that is in history now that uh, the people of Babylon were very vast in agriculture, in architecture, and in the art of war, in astronomy, and many, many other things, and the language of the Chaldeans as well. And then we're told that the king was knowledgeable enough and competent enough to examine, to question and to evaluate their level of understanding very important i just as i said some moments ago leaders of men whether in the church or outside the church must not be ignorant of essential knowledge notice that word essential essential if you're a leader in the church there's essential knowledge in the church if you if you're a leader in the world there's essential knowledge of politics if you're a leader in a particular manufacturing company there is essential knowledge of manufacturing that kind of product Leaders must not be ignorant of essential knowledge. We're looking at some leaders in the Bible in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. We're reading from verse 22. Acts 7, 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. You see that if you're going to lead people, remember, uh, when you're leading people, let's say you're a pastor in a church or a leader in a church, and uh, that church has quite a lot of people there. There are young people there who are just learning and there are technical people there who are experts and there are professional people there who are knowledgeable and there are people there that had normal practical wisdom in things of life and if you are lower than all the members in your church and various sections in your church how are you going to lead them but we're told in case of moses a leader he was knowledgeable like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was knowledgeable enough and competent enough to be able to examine all these. That's the reason why you're a leader in any part of the community. You must have some level of knowledge, competent, capable to be able to lead and direct other people. Look at Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, in John chapter 7. John chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 14. John 7, verse 14 and verse 15. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knowest this man let us having never learned? It's not about certificate. It's not about going to the regular school. But Jesus Christ had knowledge above the Pharisees, above the Sadducees. And it was noticeable to the people. And they said, how knowest this man letters, having never learned. Look at verse 45 and verse 46. Then came the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they said unto them, why have ye not brought him? And the officers answered, Never man speak like this man. You cannot say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and then you rejoice in your ignorance. And you rejoice in idleness and refusal to study. And you refuse to take the knowledge that is relevant to the calling that the Lord has given you. Any area of work you are doing in the household of faith, in the community of faith, in the kingdom of God, you must train yourself and make yourself knowledgeable in that area. In fact, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. In him, hidden there in his heart, in his life, in his brain, in his mind, hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him dwelleth. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then if uh, it says, uh, for us not to have knowledge, that is not good. Not to have knowledge. That is to 
belittle knowledge, minimize knowledge, depreciate, not disregard knowledge. I say it doesn't matter. All I need is just to get to heaven. If you don't have knowledge, your usefulness will be limited. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. I'm reading verse 2. Also, that the soul be without knowledge is not good. Think about that. That the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. I told in Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7, Malachi chapter 2. Verse 7, for the priest's lips shall keep knowledge. You're a preacher, you're a priest, you're a leader in the household of faith. Knowledge is very important. Essential knowledge. We're not talking about the knowledge of the world now. There's the knowledge that is essential to your trade. Essential to your commission. Essential to your calling. Essential to your ministry. It says, for the leaves, for the priest leaves, should keep knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of in fact, uh, what kind of pastors does God promise that he's going to give to the people of God? Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3. We're looking at verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. And if you have a pastor according to the heart of the Lord, what's the implication of that? Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Uh, but if he does not have the knowledge, how can he feed the church with knowledge? If he does not have the knowledge and the understanding, how will he be able to feed the people of God with knowledge and understanding? If we are leaders in the church, we must appreciate the essential knowledge relevant to the Christian life, the righteous life and the life of the kingdom. And God says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. What's the consequence of that? If we are pastors like that in every district, Pastors like that in every group and pastors like that in every region. Pastors like that in every state and pastors like that that will feed us with knowledge and with understanding in every nation where we have the church. Look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall they be shall he shall that be done anymore. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. That's it. When you are pastors according to the mind of the Lord, that have essential knowledge. Feeding the people with the word of God, it says Jerusalem, the headquarters of the people of God, will be called the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall gather unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. There will be transformation of life and there will be, pure, be purity of heart. When the pastors are filled with knowledge, and then the pastors are feeding the people with knowledge and truth. Then it says, in those days, in verse 18, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. You see, then it's very important, very essential. We have that kind of knowledge. That's what we're told in Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, But grow in, the, in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, you grow in grace, the spiritual, but then you need to grow in knowledge too. How do you grow in grace? By prayer, by consecration. By commitment to the Lord, you grow in grace. How do you grow in knowledge? There is it. That goes beyond prayer, by reading, by studying, by listening. That you say, I need to have the knowledge 
of the of the Lord Jesus Christ, the excellencies of Christ, the doctrines of Christ, the life of Christ, the miracles of Christ, the power of Christ, the sonship of Christ, and everything the Spirit is revealing concerning Christ. I need to study that and read that, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We're looking at uh, now on the other side of uh, verses 18 to 20. We've looked at the side of Nebuchadnezzar that he was knowledgeable enough, competent enough, capable enough uh, to be able to interview and evaluate and commune with all these four children and all the others that are gone through that course. Now, it says about uh, these other people, that is Daniel, Ananias, Azariah, and uh, Mishael, that they were ten times better because the Lord had given them wisdom. The Lord had given them uh, the kind of knowledge that they needed to have. Uh, the Lord has been doing that for other people too. This one just came uh, in the line of the faithful people, the uncompromising people that the Lord has been doing that for. We're looking at the Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. In Genesis 41, verse 14, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. In verse 38, we we'll see the knowledge that he had, the interpretation that he had, and the impact and the influence that he had because of that gift the Lord had given to him. Verse 38, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art, and thou, thou shalt be over mine house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. In verse 40, once, and, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over the land of Egypt. The Lord will do that for us. And when we're talking about Daniel, and we're talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says that they were greater, they were better, they were wiser than all the other people in Babylon. How many times greater? How many times better? Can the Lord do that for you and for me? Wiser than the people we're studying together with. Wiser than the people we're working with will be exalted in Jesus' name. Look at the promise of God. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Hold on to this. It's coming your way. This blessing you will have. Today we're reading about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who knows? Tomorrow we'll be reading about you. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm reading chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 1 and verse 2. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day. What's that? The uncompromising life. The righteous life. The sanctified life. The holy life. The committed steadfast life. If you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Then in verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them, it will happen. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, we're reading from verse 98. Thou, thou through thy commandments, 
has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. It's as you study the word of God, you consecrate your life to the Lord. He makes you wiser than even all your enemies. Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Uh, that's what we're reading about Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ten times wiser than all the wise men and all the Chaldeans, all the wise men of Babylon. They became wiser. We will become wiser. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep the precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. That's the uncompromising life. It is when you have that uncompromising life, a righteous life, a sanctified life, a saintly life. That's when you have this privilege of being greater than all the people around you. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, we sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy, through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. The Lord will do it for us. And because of what the Lord did for them, they were able to stand before the king. And let's come to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And see the privilege of having that wisdom. The privilege of having that skill. The privilege of having that ability. The privilege of having that uh, tenfold wisdom and tenfold uh, knowledge. It says in verse 19, And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. Therefore, stood they before the king. In Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 29. Proverbs 22, 29. Seest thou a man... Diligent in his business, diligent in his studies, diligent in his Christian life, diligent in his conviction, diligent in his responsibilities, diligent in his, in his duties, says thou a man, diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. What the Lord did for them, he will do for us. But told that uh, these people, as the, as the king communed with them, this is what they are. Daniel and his godly friends rose to great eminence and prominence in the land of Babylon. They had pursued their daily tasks with clear heads and pure hearts. And the Lord had reserved positions of honor for them because of the divine favor upon their faithful and uncompromising life they were employed in the honorable offices at the court and elevated to high ranks and they were given peculiar tokens of royal honor we're told that as the king came in with them with all the young men who had been trained uh, with the curriculum of the chaldeans he found these four godly uncompromising Jews ten times better than all in his realm. Much better, much wiser than all the other young men who went through the same training. And indeed, far better and wiser than all the courtiers of established reputation in Babylon. The best life is an uncompromising life. The principle and promotion of these godly righteous young men of uncompromising conviction and character confirm that godliness is profitable in all things. And it has the promise of life that now is and the life which is to come. I pray that the good thing that we have read in the lives of these young people, that same good thing, every one of us will have it in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number three, supernatural pres preservation granted for an uncompromising life. Supernatural preservation granted for an uncompromising life. We're now in Daniel chapter 1 verse 21. Daniel chapter 1 
We're reading from verse 21, and Daniel continued. Think about that. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Uh, that means that Daniel went through all the times of danger and disease. All the threats of decrease and death range in the land. But he continued. He continued in health. He continued in honor. He continued in influence and usefulness. He lived during the gloomy days of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, he remained alive. Whatever the condition in our land, he will keep us alive. He lived until the glorious days of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem by Cyrus. Throughout the favorable days in the king's palace and the fearful nights in the lion's den, he lived and continued without harm, without hurt. Think about what happened to those four uncompromising righteous people, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fire of Nebuchadnezzar was there. They went through it and they continued to live. And the lion's den was there. And Daniel went through that and continued to live. Whatever danger may be around you, if you will be on the side of the Lord, the Lord will be on your side. And then you'll come out on the other side, victorious and triumphant in Jesus' name. Through those, uh, throughout the favorable days in the king's palace, and throughout all those terrible nights, the Lord kept them. Long life was, was their own. And long after the compromisers have died and they were forgotten, uncompromising Daniel continued to live. He lived till the joyful days of Judah's release from captivity. In the way of righteousness is life. Look at it in the word of God. In uh, Proverbs chapter 12 verse 28. The reason why God kept him alive. Because of righteousness. Because of holiness. Because of his sanctified life. His steady life. An uncompromising life. In Proverbs chapter 12 verse 28. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof there is no Dead, you will not die before your time. God's divine favor kept him healthier and stronger than the compromisers who edge the king's dainty and defiled food. God loves the uncompromising life because it exalts him above the gods of the land, above the kings and the princes of the land. A Christian of uncommon conviction, a Christian of uncompromising character denies self to glorify God. He mortifies the flesh to live in obedience to God's word in all things. And his love for God is supreme and God's love for him is constant and abiding as he upholds the righteous scriptural standard of the word of God without wavering so God keeps his promises to him without wavering the promises of God include healing it will be yours good health that will be yours and long long life that will be yours in Jesus name Daniel enjoyed this promise of good health and long life with a profitable and prophetic ministry. These promises of God are still being fulfilled in the lives of the faithful children of God today, in the lives of committed and uncompromising Christians today. I want you to look at that Daniel chapter 1 again. Daniel chapter 1 verse 21. Daniel 1 verse 21. And see the promise of God fulfilled in his life because of that righteous life, that uncompromising life. And Daniel continued. That means he remained healthy. He had not died. He remained alive. I'm going to remain alive. I said I will remain alive. You will remain alive in Jesus' name. Daniel continued. You will continue. Even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Did he have a short life or a long life? Which one are you going to have? I'll show you. Let's, let's look at it together. In Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. When you live a righteous life. When you live an uncompromising life. This is the promise. Exodus chapter 23. And we're looking at verse 25. And he, sh he shall serve the Lord your God. And he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. 
they shall not sin cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I thought you will say amen. The number of your days, the number of your years, God will fulfill. Whatever calamity, whatever sickness may reign and rage in the land, it will not touch you. It will not come near you. Long life will be yours in Jesus' name. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 40, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 40, that, that thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest, tell me the next word, prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. When you live an uncompromising life, he prolongs your day. He wants you to have an extra time, a longer time of usefulness, of influence. Deuteronomy chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 33. Chapter 5, verse 33. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord shall, which ye shall possess. What we are learning is righteousness lengthens our time on earth. Righteousness prolongs our life on earth. If you want to live long life, a happy life, a healthy life, a stable life, a life without all the things that are crushing the people of the world, all you need is the life of Daniel. If you live that uncompromising life, he says he'll prolong your days over and over. He says that Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee that thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life that, that, and that thy days may be prolonged. That's what he tells every time he tells us live a righteous life is for your sake. Live a holy life. It's for our sake so that it will prolong our days. That's why it says, and Daniel continued many, many years because of that righteous life. Sanctified life brings a sound life, a long life, a happy life, a healthy life, a prosperous life. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 11. 11, I'm reading from verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 7. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did, therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong, you will be strong, and go in and possess the land, whither ye go to possess it, and that ye may prolong your days in the land. Do you see, every time he talks about holiness, about righteousness, about keeping the commandments of God, he said, I'm telling you this so that you can prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 15 But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight A perfect and just measure shalt thou have That thy days may be lengthened in the land Which the Lord thy God giveth thee It says in your commercial responsibilities In your trade, in your market In the things you sell Make sure that everything is just and balanced and perfect It says when you are truthful like that and honest like that, it's going to make sure that it prolongs your day. Chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 and 47. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the worlds which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do 
all the words of this law, for it is not in vain. It is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. It says obedience, that's your life. Righteousness, it's your life. Keeping the commandments of God, he said it's not in vain. It's for your life. He said because it is your life and through this thing, through this obedience, through this righteousness, through this holiness, through this sin, thou shalt prolong your death days in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. Chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 34. We're looking at verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural strength, his natural force abated. And if you know anybody that any of the leaders in Israel that really obeyed God, lived a righteous life, a holy life, a sanctified life, a committed life, a consecrated life. That was Moses. In fact, we are told, the Lord spoke with him as a friend speaking to a friend. And God said, Moses is faithful in all my house. And the Lord blessed him with a long, long life. I pray for all our leaders. They'll be faithful and God will bless them with long life in Jesus' name. Job, I'm reading from Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. The uncompromising lives bring long life. The sanctified life brings long life. The holy life brings long life. We're looking at Job chapter 5 from verse 19. Job 5 verse 19. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In farming, he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and farming, thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth, for thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field. And the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. Thou shalt know that the tabernacle shall be in peace. And thou shalt, uh, thou shalt uh, visit thy habitation and shall not sin. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great. Your children will be great. And thy offspring as the grass of the earth. Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like a shock of corn cometh in in his season. You see what the Lord has promised us, and that's what you are going to have. In Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. When you obey the commandments of God and you are committed like Daniel was committed to an uncompromising life of righteousness and sanctification. It says that kind of life, length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. Chapter 9 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Now we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We'll be reading about those uncompromising people in the Old Testament. And if you know anybody in the New Testament that was uncompromising, that was Paul the Apostle with many other people, see what the Lord did for him. Because he also lived a righteous life, a sanctified life, a holy life, and he was uncompromising. In Acts chapter 26 verse 22, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. That is, that's it. When you, when you live a righteous life, I continue unto this day. Yes, the shipwreck had been there. I continue until this day. Imprisonment, persecution there. I continued until this day. Those persecutions did not weaken him. I did not kill him. 
I did not give him incurable disease. But he said, the help of God was with me. Anywhere God sees righteousness, holiness, sanctification, he gives them a healthy life, long life. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue. Until this day, you will continue. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is talking to the people of God now. Yes, to children, biological children. Obey your parents in the Lord. And now those of us who are children of God and children of our Father in the Lord, it says, you obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment was promised, that it may be well with thee. It will be well with you. And thou mayest live. Thou mayest live long on the earth. You see, it's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Before I close, I'm reading from Psalm 91. Psalm 91, we're looking at verse 1. You live a righteous life, a holy life, a sanctified life, an uncompromising life. You dare to be Daniel in your community. And the Lord is telling us the beauty of that, the reward of that, the compensation for that sanctified, holy, pure, saintly life is a life that is long, that is healthy, a protected life, a healthy life, a sound life. That's what we're going to have in this place. We're looking at Psalm 91 verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield. His truth shall be thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that walk wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when uh, they were thrown into the, into the furnace of fire? The Lord Jesus Christ came to be with them. God will be with you. He will keep you sound. He'll keep you alive. He'll keep you healthy. He'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Thou, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion. And the adder, the young lion, and the dragon shall thou trample on the feet, because he has set his love upon me. That's the uncompromising life, the righteous life. You love the Lord so much, you'll not do anything contrary to his word or contrary to his will, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, will I deliver him? I will set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him, and I will honor him. Read the last verse yourself. With long life will he satisfy you, and show you his deliverance, and show you his protection. And show you a salvation. The uncompromising life attracts blessings in our lives. Make up your mind today that you live like Daniel. He purpose in his heart that he will not defile himself. The moment he was purposing in his heart that 
in this Babylon, in this place, I'm going to live a righteous life in heaven. God also purpose in his life. I'm going to show special favor to this man. The moment you purpose in your heart tonight and say, I'm going to live this righteous life by the grace of God, there will be a purpose in heaven. Long life is waiting for you. Healthy life is waiting for you. It'll make you better, richer, wiser, greater than all the people around you in Jesus' name. You're now starting to be the head and not to be the tail. And the great blessings of God will overflow in your life. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has assured us that the uncompromising life will bring blessing. Let's call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I purpose in my heart. To live a righteous life and to live a holy life, to live a sanctified life, and all the blessings and all the rewards you have for the people that live such a life and waiting, Lord, I know all those things are going to be fulfilled in my life. The life of a new creature. The life of a righteous man, a righteous woman, a saved soul, a sanctified believer. That you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I purpose in my heart. I'm going to live that righteous life. That uncompromising life. That's the life I'm going to live. A life of honesty. A life of holiness, a life of purity, a life of sanctification. I need your grace, Lord, to be so committed, to be so yielded, to be so surrendered, to be so consecrated, that whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, in the day, in the night, in the place of work, on the street, anywhere, I find myself, the grace you give to Joseph, and the grace you give to Daniel, and the grace you give to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, oh Lord, give it to me. I want to live that uncompromising life, that righteous life, that sanctified life. I want to live that kind of life. And then the blessing of healing, of health, of prosperity, of promotion, of honor, of exaltation, will come upon your life and it'll make you the head and not the tail if you are sick it will heal you and you will not be sickly holiness produces health a holy life Produces a healthy body. You will not be like the people of the world. The sicknesses on them will not be upon you. Holy and healthy. Holy and happy. Holy and honored. Holy and blessed. Holy and prospered. Holy and favored of the Lord. Commit yourself to that kind of life. Compromise brings judgment. Careless living, sinful living, unrighteous life brings judgment and wrath. But a righteous life, a sanctified life, a holy life, what great, great blessing! That brings upon our lives. Go over those promises again. 
long life, lengthened life, prolonged life, the years of your life increased, it breaks every yoke in your life, cancels every curse in your life, and your nose destroys all the intention of Satan, of the demons in your life. Because of that uncompromising lie. A holy life is an influential life. A righteous life is an influential life. A pure life is an influential life. You'll influence your friends. You'll have a soul saving influence on your friends. Daniel at that. He influenced Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Soul winning influence. A soul saving influence. A sanctifying influence. A righteous influence. He influence them to also, to also take their stand. Influence your friends. Influence them for Christ. Influence them for righteousness. Influence them to be steady, stable, solid in their Christian conviction. Influence them to live holy and righteous and sanctified lives. Teach them what you know. Tell them the decisions you have taken. Draw them into that same decision. To live holy, righteous, sanctified life. You'll be a soul winner. And the souls win to the Lord. Will be righteous. Will be holy. Will take the same stand that you take. You're a Christian leader. Don't you have other friends who are Christian leaders? Influence them to be uncompromising. You're a preacher. Don't you have other friends who are preachers? Influence them to stand solidly on the truth of the word of God. You're a woman leader. Don't you have other women leaders who are your friends, your companions? Influence them. To take a firm stand for righteousness. As God is blessing you like Daniel, he'll bless your friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Be a positive influence in the lives of your friends. Be a purifying influence. Sanctifying influence. On your friends, on your companions, on members of your family. Make friends of God's children, your, your friends in your conduct, his likeness shall see. Daniel was a prayerful man. That's how he had the strength, the courage, the boldness. To take his stand in that land of Babylon, that in the midst of corruption, he lived a cleansed life, a holy life, a purified life, a God honoring life. Be a man of prayer, be a woman of prayer. Commit all these studies to the Lord and say, Lord, reproduce this in my life. Lord, reproduce this in my life. Holiness unto the Lord. Sanctification is the will of God. If you were thinking it was impossible to live such a life, you've seen men of like passions like you are. You've seen Daniel. You've seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How they took their stand. With all the things around them. 
And God is no respecter of persons. We have not because we ask not. They added because they asked the Lord. And as you ask the Lord, he'll give the same thing to you, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Let him ask in faith. You're asking for the power to live that uncompromising life, the grace to live that righteous, sanctified, holy life, and the grace to be a powerful, positive, purifying influence upon your friends and companions. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. And the Lord will give it to him. That's what the Lord said he will do. Ask him and he will do it. He's still saving sinners today. Lord, save me. He will save you. He's still sanctifying believers today. Lord, sanctify me. He will do it. He's still giving courage and boldness to live the uncompromising life to his children today. Ask him, Lord, I want to be a Daniel in my generation. He will do it. And it is not in vain. This is your life. That he may keep you healthy. Keep you righteous. Keep you honored. Keep you favored. And give you long life. Enough confidence to claim the promises of God, to claim the blessing of God. When there's no guilt, no condemnation in your heart. When the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. That the grace to live in righteousness and holiness, the Lord is giving to you, has given to you. That grace is active. Then you'll be able to claim the promise of God. If you're sick, he heals. If you're healthy, now he keeps you well, keeps you healthy. Will lengthen your days, prolong your life. A long happy, holy, healthy life, useful life, profitable life. And it says, it will exalt you, honor you, promote you above all nations around you. Make you the head and not the tail. Think about that. If you'll be honest, faithful, submissive, righteous, holy, sanctified, uncompromising in your life, unwavering in your commitment to the Lord, He too will be faithful, unwavering in blessing you, giving you a happy life, a prosperous life, a healthy life, long, long life. And no matter what persecutors or enemies propose, all their proposition will be cancelled. All their demonic, devilish intention or wish will be annulled, destroyed, taken out of the way. So that uncompromising Daniel will enjoy the benefit of that long, 
healthy, prosperous, stable life. That's the promise of the Lord. Take your stand for the Lord. And the Lord will stand by you. Take your stand for the Lord. And the Lord will stay with you. And yours will be the reward, the recompense, the compensation of an uncompromising life. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation and the Lord will keep you happy and healthy. 